as you know we've got to be connected and um, the faster and the more stable the connection the better and uh, not so long ago we were traveling in uh, Republic of Ireland and we were in very remote places and really struggling with connectivity so uh, we thought we'd take you through Starlink we, we thought we'd give Starlink a bash and so this is us uh, pretty much unboxing this and talking about the practical implications of using Starlink so hi folks I'm Roger from Off Grid Van Life and uh, we do th all things related to van. We love our lithium ion phosphate batteries that we uh, sell and all sorts of things like that. So <clears throat> getting back to this, uh, we, we had a lot of frustration here at our base with uh, steam driven internet connectivity. Uh, we never get more than a meg upload and it's usually only about five or six download and uh, with several of us here and uh, being quite high bandwidth users it's been very frustrating. So uh, we're several miles from the uh, the fiber cabinet and uh, so to have fiber brought down to here would be quite prohibitively expensive. So we thought we'd give uh, Starlink a bash and uh, what I want to do is to take you through the uh, from our point of view the practical implications of uh, looking at a Starlink uh, solution. We have looked at others and we'll be doing a YouTube comparing uh, various solutions uh, and that'll be aimed at really at van life. Um, so this is partly looking at van life because um, it is and Starlink are making it easier and easier to travel with your Starlink dishes but there are some practical implications to consider. Um, of course it gets very expensive uh, what you pay to Starlink to travel with these. So <clears throat> let's get on with it. This box is the standard box that you get from Starlink when you buy it. Uh, here in the UK we pay 500 pounds. I think in the US it's similar 500-ish dollars or somewhere thereabouts and I think pretty much everywhere in the world it's a fairly standard price that you pay. We know that uh, Starlink are subsidizing the cost of these dishes uh, because they cost a bit more than that 500 pounds to manufacture apparently. I, I don't know what the current manufacturing costs are but it used to be that they were just about double what we were paying. So let's uh, get this box open. So uh, quite nice packaging. But a box is a box is a box. So let's see what's inside here. Right we start off with uh, just a big piece of cardboard. Uh, second we go to another big piece of cardboard but this is the I presume this is the only uh, instruction set I don't know actually uh, we'll see <laughs> um, it looks all simple um, <clears throat> open up this great big bit of packaging here and uh, we get to the stand so here is the stand now let me just talk to this a little bit um, I, I did have a look at this and I thought well uh, in a property like ours you've got uh, trees, uh, power lines, uh, phone lines, um, uh, all sorts of things like that and where where are we going to put this down on the ground or a flat bit of something uh, to have um, the dish get a clear view of the sky. So we know that uh, in the northern hemisphere the dish needs to get a little bit more of a northern orientation of the sky, clear skies towards the north. In the southern hemisphere it's the opposite. So we looked around our property and quite frankly this stand whilst it's nice and solid and robust and stable, it's got little holes in the corner where you can uh, sort of peg it down to something. Practically uh, this is a scratch your head, not sure where we're going to actually put it. So we'll get to that later. So let's just put this to one side. Now the all important dish. Here is the Starlink dish. Uh, in the old days it used to be a big round dish. Now it's as you can see it's a rectangular dish. Um, so the dish is uh, motorized. So it's attached here. There are motors here so when uh, this thing goes up it is going to move about and get into the position that it needs to get into. So it's quite, I don't know what the weight is, but it's quite heavy. So perhaps not that uh, easy for the wind to blow it around. Um, but yeah, it does need to get to a point where it has absolutely clear view of the skies. And so uh, it's going to need to be secured 
it, it would normally just slot into this thing here. Um, but as I said, we don't see that this is practical at all. So the dish basically terminates in this uh, wireless router. And, um, <clears throat> uh, and again, there's a, a little bit of a problem in that uh, these days Starlink don't have any Ethernet connectivity, as in cabling. Um, so if you wanted to connect this to your existing mesh system at home, or your existing router, uh, wireless network, whatever, uh, you've got a challenge, you've got to get some extra stuff. So basically, this is the dish, and this is the big cable that comes to the router, and that basically is it. The idea is you plonk the dish down on the stand somewhere where it's got a clear view of the skies. Um, let's just put this down in here so I don't drop it. Uh, <clears throat> run the cable down to somewhere, uh, here's a, a plug, uh, in, in our case it's a British, British plug to go into the power, which powers the router and the router in turn uh, with quite a substantial, fairly long cable, powers the dish. We know from a lot of YouTubes uh, that, and, and other bits of information that this dish contains some uh, advanced and lots of um, little cells in it and lots of uh, electro equipment in it, so a lot of electronics inside the dish. So <clears throat> this, as I said, costs 500 pounds uh, to get started with Starlink. And when we looked at this, we thought, well, actually to plug it into our home system, it's, uh, we don't have everything that we need. So if you were traveling with just a van and you had the roaming option and, and Starlink have now started to implement that in more and more places, uh, then um, in theory you could uh, stop somewhere, plonk this down where you've got a clear view and get things up and running but, um, and use the, the wireless uh, router just to connect to. Uh, we then researched it a bit further and you have to practically, if you want to connect it to your home mesh system or your home Wi-Fi system, you need to buy this little device here, which basically uh, inserts itself into this long cable here. So you would plug this into the router and then the cable into this in, over here. And here you have an Ethernet port that you can then plug a standard Ethernet cable and send that to your your home system, your um, mesh or whatever you're using. In our case, we use TP-Link mesh and it works incredibly well. It is very effective on this property and we didn't want to get rid of it. So, and I know Starlink have just brought out their own mesh system, but I think each of these units costs about 180 pounds of their mesh system. So we've got five mesh devices, uh, multiply that by five, that's a huge cost to get up and running with Starlink's mesh system. So TP-Link is what we'll stick with. It's been very good and robust and we'll plug a cable into here and into our TP-Link mesh system. So that's the first item that you also have to buy. And I can't remember the exact cost, but it's about 40 pounds, 30, 40 pounds uh, in British money that you have to pay for this thing. Then, <clears throat> as I said, how are, are we gonna actually mount this? If we put this on top of the barn roof um, or a shed roof or a house roof or, or a roof that has a fairly good view, you're gonna have to tie it down. Um, what if the roof is slanted too much for this then to adjust its angle and that sort of thing. So. Practically speaking, I, I don't know how many people would actually use this beautifully made stand. Um, so we bought another adapter, which I'm sure this was uh, 50, 60 pounds, quite pricey for what it is. And this, all that this is, is a pipe adapter. So basically you have this unit, which will uh, plug into the bottom here. Let's turn this this way. Um, you'd probably run the cable straight down through, the, through this here, but basically this unit you're going to plug in. So that clips into place. And then you've got uh, three sets of grub screws here that uh, you, you tighten in the screws or in the box somewhere. They're in the box that you put these screws and you put a pipe in here 
uh, and then that pipe goes to a bracket or whatever you want. There are, are other options. There are options with Starlink that uh, you can buy a unit that uh, you can screw straight onto a wall. There's some extended for where you get eaves that come out quite far. So Starlink do offer several alternatives to the stand, but they all cost uh, more money. So practically speaking, um, your get up and running costs in the UK uh, would actually be closer to about 600 pounds just for the equipment that you need. Um, we also need the pole for this. So, you know, uh, depending on what, how high your mast is going to be to get a clear view of the skies, you, you may be paying up to even sort of 700 pounds just to get up and running with your Starlink system. So that's, uh, that's something that you do need to take into account. It's a, it's a very high startup cost compared to uh, many of the sort of cheaper broadband and that sort of thing. But yeah, that's something you just need to take into account. Um, what we'll be doing next is to actually mount this. So we'll, we'll, uh, we wanted this to be a very practical thing of, of how you would realistically actually get up and running. So we want to approach it from two angles. One is uh, at, our, at our base here, uh, where are we going to actually mount this thing? How is it going to work? Um, and we'll show you how uh, the Starlink app, app actually works to try and find the spot that's going to be give you a clear view of the skies. Let me just speak to that for a short moment. So again, hundreds of YouTubes out there, so we don't want to be competing with them, but practically uh, this thing uses low Earth orbit uh, uh, satellites, LEOs, uh, and uh, they're not like the standard satellites that sit so many thousand kilometers above the equator and stay in one place. Uh, these are far lower, closer to the Earth, a very short or very small latency when you connect to them. The satellites, uh, are they need to move really fast uh, in order to maintain their altitude. If they move slower, they crash to the Earth. If they move faster, they then go out into space kind of thing. So they, they've, uh, suffice to say, the satellites don't keep still. They're moving really fast around the Earth at a low Earth orbit. Uh, so this needs a very clear line of sight, as, as I said, in the northern hemisphere, to, uh, aiming sort of towards the north, up into the sky. And anything like a power line or a tree or a pole or a chimney or anything like that uh, will at some stage, at some point in the day, get between this dish and the satellite that it's communicating with. So that's why if you want a stable connection that you can do things like remote desktop and VPN and, and actually work effectively. And I'm not talking about just basic internet browsing where you can wait a little bit for the connection to re-establish. I'm talking about things like remote desktop where if the connection breaks, you have to re-login you know, re in and all that sort of thing. So we, we are very keen to see how well this works in that sort of scenario. Uh, and they will be taking you through that in the future. But yeah, uh, for now, this is the unit that, as I said, practically up to 600 pounds and if you take into account the pole and everything else probably close to 700 pounds to get up and running so we will see uh, we'll show you how we find the spot and use the app to see if there are any clear obstacles according to the app so one of the uh, challenges that you'll face with uh, any any form of satellite internet but uh, this is true of starlink is where exactly do you put the dish and uh, generally we like to camp in a spot that looks like this. Uh, nice views, nice trees. Uh, we'll have some apples here eventually. It's a beautiful spot. But um, Starlink provides you with this application, uh, which I'm going to screen record on here and we'll film it and show you what the results look like. So basically what you have to do is you have to scan the sky and they've got some very clever software that tells you if it's a decent spot. So let me step closer in here we know this is not going to be a decent spot because uh, it won't get a good line of sight to the north and it generally needs to look and that is north there. So we're going to have a, a problem with those. So basically, uh, let's, we, we try this and what you have to do is they sort of give you an arc that you have to collect this data in. So let's try that. Go to 84, 88, 89, 92. A bit there. Right, I've come up with this uh, so you can view results. It'll probably be too faint for you to see clearly on the camera, 
but you can view results. <coughs> and you can see as it's spinning, for some odd reason they say this is a decent spot, but I, I have no idea why they say that because we know it won't actually work. But if you look at this, uh, you will see that uh, this red is coming around. So basically this is in the, in the north and the east there are these obstacles that uh, it won't be able to get a good connection. So what that will do, if you have any red, really what that'll do is that at different times of the day, you may drop the signal, sometimes for a few seconds, sometimes a few minutes, and if it's really bad, sometimes a few hours. So the idea is that you want to get a complete clear line of sight. The app does help somewhat to find your spot. So this is very pertinent if you're, especially if you're in a van and you want to camp at a nice shady spot, uh, beautiful trees, a uh, nice setting like this. It's not going to be uh, usable really. You're going to have to camp out further out into the open. And Starlink does need a, you know, a good view, big view of the sky to operate. It's not like one of those uh, geosynchronous satellites that you've got to dish in a very small beam going very vertical pretty much. Starlink needs to use quite a bit of the sky because these satellites are moving over really fast and it needs to track them with its very clever software and, and hardware wizardry in there. So if you, even if you're um, looking for a location at a, a static location as we have been just to uh, test the site, you still need to uh, find a good spot. So we've opted to go for a spot that's uh, really high, very clear view of the sky. There will not be a single obstruction other than a bird or an aeroplane and a very clear view of the sky and we expect to have uh, no outages at all or very few outages if any. So there's Nigel up there checking out an existing pole that we have uh, with the idea that uh, we can lower that uh, bracket that's so if I zoom in and uh, there's a bracket there that's holding a cable that runs to another part of the barn and the idea is that uh, we'll lower that so we can get the pipe adapter provided by Starlink onto there and uh, we'll need to then make sure that those are still attached and tightened and that the anchor which goes down to the wall there we might need to move that slightly to uh, keep it pulling the cable so that is probably where it's going to go so it's at the top of a large barn as you can see it has complete clear view of the sky and uh, it should give us a really good connection. The whole thing is quite stable. Nigel's busy shaking it just to see how good it's going to be because we get some fairly strong gales here on the odd occasion and obviously that dish is going to need to just sit there nice and tight. Okay so what we're going to be doing is just uh, putting a new bracket on over here and then moving these two supporting cables here. Just cut this bracket off because these threads are toast we'll never get those off i don't think so just gonna move this down a bit to create some space here for the uh, pipe adapter to sit on Right, so there we go, we've moved the bracket slightly lower and uh, got a couple of D-shackles on there to move the cables lower. So it gives us some space at the top there to be able to put the pole mount for the dish. Alright, so we've got the pole adapter on there with the wire for the uh, system coming up through that pole dropping out the bottom. So I'm going to put the solar, uh, the panel on here now, dish, and connect it all up.
No, that looks perfect. Let's try it like that. Okay, and here we have it. Looking pretty good. Mounted on that pole there. Cable's going down the middle. Nice and neat. So yeah, let's see how it works. Nigel putting the cable up. We have the dish mounted, as you can see, up there. So it's got some serious height. I'm sure that uh, not many people mount theirs that high. But this was the easiest uh, and the clearest view of the sky because we have trees and cables and poles. So we run the cable down inside the pipe and it's running along there and we then join up with our existing uh, TP-Link Deco mesh system. Uh, we've just done a speed test and on mine I get a, well, the fastest I've got so far is about 230 megs down up. Uh, the fastest I've got so far is 19 megs up. So the, the upload speed is about double what we used to get as a download. And our download used to be, you know, okay, but our upload was pitiful. So having anything over 10 megs up is just great. So uh, the Starlink is busy uh, running itself, checking things and uh, setting itself. And I think after about 24 hours, uh, it's then gathered a whole lot of information about obstacles and things like that. Of course, it, this one won't find any obstacles, so it should be uh, really good. Hoping for some really fast, stable internet. But so far, really pleased with what I see. So as we mentioned in the beginning, one of the problems we have is that our internet is quite slow for uploading these sort of videos and that. So hopefully this will be a huge improvement. Um, usually I have to leave things uploading overnight so that Nigel can edit and, and send them up to our channel. Um, but this should make a huge, huge difference to how fast I can upload content. So hopefully uh, you'll benefit from that in the future. But uh, thanks for watching and, and I hope this was interesting, although it wasn't our usual stuff about batteries and van builds and that. Hopefully you did find this quite interesting and uh, see you on the next video.